Well, hello, hello, hello. Happy Friday. Uh, we are officially into spring. Uh, if you're here in Southern California with me, it has felt like spring the last couple of days. Beautiful weather outside. Um, as one of my clients said, beautiful weather to look at houses that will get a bunch of offers on them. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the stats, but first I, I want to talk about something that has really been on a lot of your minds and that people have talked to me a lot about separately. So I feel like it's worth talking about here. And that is this question of, is supply and demand broken? And, and I know we touched upon this a couple of months ago. Uh, an economist famously said, maybe, maybe supply and demand will start working again in the housing market. And you know, my answer to that was, when it doesn't appear that supply and demand are working, it just means you don't understand the supply and or the demand. And I think what's really interesting to me is, you know, most of us think of something in a very, in very simple terms, right? And the, the simplest term is, if you raise the price of something, demand should go down. Um, and that part is true, but that doesn't always mean, it, it doesn't always translate the way people think it will. And I think a great example of that is uh, you know gasoline prices, right? I would say that the happiness over buying gasoline has gone down significantly, but the numbers of actual consumption have not changed that much. And housing is very similar in, in a way that, you know, we have some control over how many housing units we need as a society, right? Um, but for the large, really for the most part, our housing demand is really ultimately determined by household formation. And it, we can't on the fly adjust that number. So if housing costs twice as much tomorrow, um, yes, a lot of people would probably become homeless, a lot of things would happen, but the bulk and the majority of people would just cut out other things and find a way to make rent somehow. That's, and, and I think we've seen that happen up until now. So I don't mean this to be kind of like a little bit of a political rant, but I think that's kind of an economic reality. And I think that explains some of the response that we've seen in our market. We are undersupplied for housing, and the fact that rates are rising doesn't seem to be affecting the market quite as much as we would have expected. And I think a big part of that is that our market, I think, will start reacting in a reduction of transactions, not in a lowering of prices. And I think that will be the first move. And I think you know, nobody knows where that magic line is, right? Of how much can the market react before the pricing actually does start to take its toll, right? Like to where interest rates take their toll on home prices. You know, how much price increase can the market tolerate? You know, it's it's kind of like gasoline, right? If, if, if gas is $5 a gallon and it goes to six fifty dollars a gallon, which I think is a, a fairly accurate representation or four fifty dollars to six fifty, dollars um, that is a huge burden to people, but it's not, quite enough of a burden for people to, for example, decide to take the bus places. It, it really isn't enough. I think gas prices would have to go to $10 a gallon before people started taking the bus. And I think we're seeing something similar with home prices. Nobody likes the fact that their payments are rising and yet people are just finding ways to make those higher payments work because they want a house. They don't want to be a renter. They want some solidarity in their life against future price increases. Right, they they want to lock something in, and so I don't think we're we're near that pain point yet. And so, you know, one of the questions a lot of lenders have is, where are we going to go on interest rates? And and I don't really know. I don't really want to give a conjecture. I think most of the common estimates a few months ago were that we were going to end up at five percent by the end of the year. Well, uh, it's almost April, and we are mid fours, um, so we don't have a lot of room left to go for the rest of the year. So. Um, you know, we're seeing inflation be even bigger than we expected. The Fed's ramping up rates uh, to try to reel that in. Um, so I really don't know where we're going to end up on that. I mean, that's the real question, right? Where is going to be that pain point in housing where we say shortage be damned, people aren't buying houses. And, and I don't think we're there yet. And that's why people seem almost befuddled by this is that buying still is a better alternative than renting, where renting is going up as well. And people need some place to live. We can't suddenly reduce our overall demand for housing, rental or bought on a whim. It doesn't work like that. It's, it's what you call a very price inelastic commodity, right? Um, oil is a very price inelastic commodity. The price has to move a huge amount 
before consumption radically changes. Um, and I think, yeah, is there a point in housing where people start to move in together? Yes, that there is a point where that will happen. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think that um, especially if we see any kind of wage market gains, that really is going to bolster the ability for those housing payments to go up. So, uh, you know, in a, in a market like this, where I think that a lot of our inflation is being driven by factors other than people making more money uh, or getting higher salaries, um, I think that those wages are going to be a delayed reaction, but, you know, we should start seeing some of those wage increases. I am hearing about companies uh, giving bigger raises because of inflation. So that is starting to happen. Anyhow, let's jump into it and see what's happening now that we've kind of given a little bit of that primer on what we're seeing. So no surprise here, prices are going up and have been going up. Shocking news. I know you've been feeling it in the market. We've been feeling it. Um, if you look here. Again, remember there's there's variation on this, but look at this trend line since the beginning of the year, that upward slope, we're all experiencing it. Same thing down here for our condo market. Uh, we did see a big swing between last week and this week. Again, I think that's some you know noise in the signal. Look for the trend line. Um, I think what's interesting also here is to look at where payments have gone, right? Like we are approaching $5,000 a month for that entry level uh, home at 5% down, including mortgage insurance, taxes, everything. I mean, that we are approaching $5,000 a month for that entry level single family home. And, you know, we're kind of hovering around that $3,800, $3,900, $4,000 mark for our entry level condo. Um, you know, as you can see from a household income perspective, it's not terribly dire news. Um, the minimum income you need is still below $120,000. To, to go into that entry level single family home. Um, I don't think that's a completely insurmountable goal for families. Even if you throw in a car payment into that, I think even if you were you know, above 150, that's still qualifying. So that's 75,000 a person in a two earner household. Uh, and then obviously we're in the nineties here for our entry level condos. Kind of switching gears, where is our absorption rate? What are we seeing? Um, you know, to me, this really is the sign that a market has turned a corner and we don't see it. We're, we're in the mid 80s uh, where we've been for a large portion of the time for the last year, uh, meaning that, gosh, you know, the, the market is absorbing these listings uh, at about the same rate they're coming on the market. Um, remember, not all listings sell. So, you know, 100% absorption actually means you're really absorbing faster than stuff's coming in the market. Some people change their mind. They pull homes off the market. They're unrealistic in their price, et cetera. So not every listing that comes on is really a realistic, ready and willing seller. But if you look here, uh, you know, 86% is still what we call a hyper, uh, you know, competitive market. Here's some good news, right? I, I like good news. I like giving first time home buyers good news. Our spring inventory level has gone up and ascended to about the same point we were at last year. Now, I will tell you about the middle of April of last year is when we started to see that acceleration in entry-level home inventory through the summer, through towards the end of August, right? That's when we really grew. And I'm wondering, are we going to see this trend continue? But as of year over year, we're at about the same inventory level on those entry-level single-family homes. So it's not actually any worse than it was last year anymore. So take the wins where you can get them if you're a first-time home buyer. Our entry level condo inventory continues to really be decimated versus last year. I think we predicted that that market was going to tighten and it did, but those homes are still out there and available, just not as many as before. If we look at our percentage still active, you know, this does move around week to week, but, you know, look at this general trend. Lower is more competitive. We are lower than we were through the summer of last year and very similar to where we were uh, during uh, during the spring of last year. So what this says is the homes that are coming up now are getting gobbled up um, pretty quickly. And finally, we have our week's supply of homes. Uh, condos, that again is persistently low. Uh, our condo inventory is now about the same, uh, relatively speaking, meaning if no new homes came on the market, how many weeks would it take before there were no homes left? Uh, we're just over three weeks for the condos, and I think we're right about, right about, or maybe even just under three weeks for our entry-level single-family homes. Uh, the single-family home level is slightly better or about the same as last year, 
but obviously our condo market at three weeks is significantly worse than we were at last year. No surprise that overall entry level inventory is down too. I know this is a little bit of a fast uh, update. And one of the things I wanted to tell you if you're a first time home buyer is, you know, I think there's this temptation really to, to, to sit there and look in that rear view mirror and be like, oh, what I could have got three years ago or how the market was three years ago. And, and I really don't, don't waste your mental energy. Don't beat yourself up on that. It's not worth it. I think if, if I were a first time home buyer in this market, I would spend my time thinking and trying to answer two very important questions. And question number one is, is it a good time for me to buy a home? How do I feel about my job prospects? How do I feel about geography? How do I feel about just my housing needs? Like, am I expecting that I will suddenly need more space or I don't know yet or that's up in the air? So those, those would be the questions I'd be asking myself. And what I really try to say is, is it a good time for me to buy a home? Can I qualify uh, and afford something that is useful to me? Okay, so that's question number one. Question number two, what should I buy? And I think this is the question that, that really people don't spend that much time answering. I think they, they kind of look at, they look at houses online, they play what I call housing hot or not, flipping through, and they sort of let their emotions guide them. And really, I think if there was ever a market to not behave that way, it's this one. Um, some things that you really want to think about, if you have some geographic uncertainty in your future, Gosh, buy a house that might make a great rental home, right? A property that you know where the numbers will work. Maybe even this property that would work as an Airbnb because it is near uh, a tourist type area. I think really sort of setting yourself up for multiple pathways to success is what I would be doing. I'd be putting that legwork in to really define what it is I was looking for. And then I'd be diligent about looking for it and, and you know, understanding I'm, I'm going to go in the market. I'm going to look for sort of what is my target that I'm trying to buy. Those of you who love architecture, I know this is especially difficult. Um, look for my target out there and just be diligent about looking for it. Not feel rushed, but also not feel lazy about it either. And I, I think kind of adopting that more business-minded approach is really the right frame of mind and the right way to do it right now in this market. Um, thank you so much for watching. Again, questions, comments, we always love them. Uh, if you or someone you know should be a home buyer and they are not a homeowner, definitely reach out to us in the Southern California area. We would love to lend you our expertise. Do not forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And we will see you again real soon.